Uh, good evening, everyone. Let's make a start. Uh, my name's uh, Mayor Patrick Hall. Tonight is uh, Tuesday, the 7th of December 2021, and this agenda briefing session is starting now just a little bit late, uh, about two minutes past uh, 6 pm. Uh, welcome. I'd like to start, of course, by acknowledging the Wadjuk people, the tra traditional custodians of this land, and we also pay our respects, of course, to elders both past and present. Tonight's meeting is for the purpose of asking questions and seeking clarification on agenda items for the next ordinary council meeting, which will be held uh, in these chambers next Tuesday evening. No decision making or entering into debate is to occur at this meeting. Can I please ask before we start that uh, everybody present please turns off all electronic devices, especially mobile phones, iPads uh, and tablets for the duration of tonight's uh, briefing. Tonight's agenda briefing is also being recorded a copy of the audio recording shall be available on the city's website within 72 hours of the meeting. Agenda briefings are public meetings and any information that you provide this evening may be publicly accessible. Just in relation to disclosures of interest, the prescribed disclosure requirements apply to meetings that are convened under the provisions of the Local Government Act. However, it may be perceived as ethically unacceptable and at odds with the probability <coughs> and accountability principles of the Act and codes of conduct for elected members to participate in forums, briefings or workshops where they are aware that they have a conflict of interest and do not declare it. In the interests of openness and accountability, elected members are encouraged to always disclose a conflict of interest where they are aware that they have one when attending a forum, briefing or workshop and where applicable remove themselves from the room whilst the matter is being discussed. At attendance, we have a number of apologies. Um, our Deputy Mayor Kunza uh, is not able to be with us this evening, uh, and Councillor Jacobs is just running a little bit late. Uh, he has provided notice. He'll be here uh, about half past six or thereabouts. Approved leave of absence, uh, there are none at item 2.2. .2. At item three, disclosures of interest. Uh, CEO, are there any disclosures this evening? Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor, none at this time. Thank you. We received no disclosures of interest. Uh, so at items 3.1 and 3.2 being de declarations of interest, uh, there are none. Question time for the public. Uh, 4.1, response to previous questions taken on notice, uh, there are none. At item 4.2, questions from the public. The time set aside for public question time is 15 minutes, which may be extended if necessary. A question must relate to items listed on this agenda paper. For recording purposes, please state your name and address and then proceed to ask your question. If an answer cannot be provided at tonight's meeting, the question will be taken on notice and an answer will be provided at the next ordinary council meeting. In accordance with policy AD02, members of the public who have registered their interest to ask questions with the city's administration shall be called upon in the order in which registrations were received. Written questions will precede verbal questions. Uh, I'm now opening public question time at 6.05pm uh, uh, and I do have a uh, question here registered from uh, Mr Richard Aldridge. Mr Aldridge, would you like to step forward? Good afternoon, Council. Um, my first question is with the monitoring policy that's coming up, um, is any of that um, needed to fulfil the requirements of Smart Street and Smart Monitoring applications that the City has already made? Uh, Director McQuaid. No, um, there is nothing required in the policy, nor is there anything currently preventing the City from applying any Smart City technologies. Ms Aldridge. Um, so the smart street, um, sorry, the smart cameras that were um, in the initial application for the smart street um, on Cecil Avenue um, when you applied for the grant at, um, for the federal government, that didn't require smart cameras? Director. Firstly, the city has never applied for any federal funding for Cecil, street, Cecil Avenue Smart Street. We did apply for funding for Wall Street Basin, but no federal funding has ever been sought. Secondly, the application in, smart, in Cecil Avenue in the Smart Street is smart poles. Uh, the smart poles do have the ability for the city to add monitoring technologies, but at this point in time we do not apply any of those. At the time at which we uh, implemented Cecil Avenue, there were no CCTV cameras. At this point in time, there are three CCTV cameras facing the bus shelter in response to acts of vandalism. 
Mr. Uh, Aldridge, your uh, second. Last question. Um, what's the purpose of these smart poles? In Cecil Avenue? Uh, it, well, I don't know. I, I just want to know what a smart pole is. Can you just explain the premise around a smart pole? To the best of my knowledge, um, smart poles are, uh, enable IoT or Internet of Things technology to be applied, so they are digitally connected, they are wireless, um, they would allow the city to add monitoring devices such as environmental air quality devices um, or other forms of technology. You can apply people counting technology. Uh, there's a range of things under the IoT umbrella uh, that could be utilised with a smart pole. Um, and it also obviously is a better form of lighting that can be applied through the street. Uh, yeah. So currently they're just a light? Currently they are just a light. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from uh, members of the public? Thank you. We'll uh, close question time then at 6.08pm. Uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, deputations this evening. We do have a deputation um, this evening. We have a deputation which has been approved um, from Mr Robert Suan. Mr Suan, would you like to step forward? Good evening. Thank you. Can I ask you just to introduce yourself to the uh, meeting uh, and uh, go ahead with your deputation. Uh, you have up to 10 minutes. <coughs> Mr Mayor, uh, my name is... Um Robert Duncan Sewan, Justice of the Peace, 40 Central Road, Ross Moyne. I wish to report, in my opinion, the substantive motion is amended, moved by Councillor Cruz, seconded by Councillor Holland, at the OCM on the 18th of May 2021, EN 00721, item 7.4, under Director of Canning Environment, EN 02721, outcome of liaison with state agencies strategies to alleviate erosion and improve water quality at Shelley Beach Park. EN 02721, outcome of liaison with state agencies strategies to alleviate erosion and improve water quality at Shelley Beach Park that is in this briefing Kenny City Council has not acted in compliance, in my opinion, with the Swan Canning River Protection Strategy 2015 to implement actions addressing the strategic issues with the Water Corporation, Swan River Trust and the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions. It is apparent from these briefing recommendations that neither the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, DBCA, nor the City of Canning Responsible Officer or the Water Corporation regarding the drainage outflow foreshore erosion has taken on board any heed or accepted their responsibility in addressing the OCM 18 May 2021 substantive motion decision, which was to reinstate the eroded River Park Canning location 1859 Reserve 26292 Foreshore as reserved land restitution in support of the City of Canning urban dwelling infill. The item one and item three of the responsible officer because requests for council support are not applicable nor substantive to the EN 00721 motion with any references for councillors or public advice or any corporate or other governing policy prohibiting reinstatement of Crown Reserve lands, river foreshore or otherwise. My deputation is under Officer Recommendation 2, that Council, under Recommendation 2, requests that the Interim Chief Executive Officer undertakes the Mayoral and Councillor's instruction for a Shelley Waters Swan Canning River Park Community Consultative Survey in relation to reinstatement of the eroded River Park Canning Location 1859 Reserve 2692 Foreshore at Shelley Beach Park. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sewan. Thank you very much for coming down this evening.
Uh, at item five, uh, items brought forward for the convenience of those in the public gallery. There are none this evening. We'll move on to reports. Uh, reports of committee meetings. Uh, we have CC 056 of 21, uh, the title of the report being Annual Report and Financial Statements 2020 to 2021. The recommendation is on page of the uh, page four of tonight's agenda and is on screen. Councillors, any questions in relation to that item? None, thank you. We'll move on to item um, OC008 of 21, advertising of the strategic uh, plan 2021-2031. Uh, the officer's recommendation appears on page 16 of the agenda and is also on screen. And I'd also like to acknowledge that we have a number of um, uh, members of the public here who were front and centre uh, during uh, the uh, process and helped us with the, uh, the strategic community plan consultation. I'd like to thank them for their involvement on behalf of the community and, and acknowledge their presence um, here at tonight's meeting. So thank you very much for coming along. Uh, councillors, are there any, um, recommend, uh, any questions in relation to that matter? The recommendation will be that uh, the council endorses the draft City of Canning strategic community plan for 2021-2031, and also that it notes that a further report to consider final adoption of the strategic community plan will be presented following community consultation. If there are no further questions, I'll move on. Thank you, councillors. I'll move on to CC 054 of 21, proposed variation to lease part uh, lot 92 in brackets 12 to 14, Coulson Way in Canning. The officer's recommendation appears on page 23 of tonight's agenda and is also on screen. Are there any questions in relation to that item? Councillor Bain. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, when does the city expect the full sale of the subject land to occur? Director Bow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm happy to take that question on notice and uh, provide the elected members with the response. Thank you. Anything further, Councillor? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, will it cost the city any money to execute the required subdivision? Director. Um, Mr. Mayor, just in relation to that, that, that will be covered by, by the city. We're expecting some surveyors' costs and some application to the Planning Commission as it would be part of a normal subdivision process, but not an exorbitant amount, but I can get a, um, an accurate estimation on that. There'll be some sundry costs in the city. You'll get back to us uh, on the record with, um, with some provisional <coughs> costings for that item. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Holland, you had a question? Yeah, just a general one. I was, I was curious, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was curious to, to see why in the, the interim, at least because it was incompatible zoning under the planning, local planning scheme, um, should we have entered into this when it wasn't already done? When all the work hadn't been done, should we have entered it into in, in the first place, or we should have, or should we have waited until the um, the zoning under local planning scheme, which is what we're doing now? Director um, Bug. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think the information was provided at the time. We did some research and we're. we're quietly confident that the rezoning would be supported by the Planning Commission, um, but we expected the, the rezoning to take um, significantly longer than it actually has. As a result, we wanted to um, give some certainty to CAMCO about the actual uh, sale and the transaction in the land, submit the subdivision application, but uh, in the event that the, the Planning Commission have turned around uh, the subdivision approval earlier than expected, Councillor Holland. Councillor Holland, thank you. Any further questions on that item, councillors? Thank you. We'll move on to the next item. Uh, that was uh, CC 05021, uh, late item, monthly financial report, November 2021. Any questions on that item? None, thank you. We move on to uh, CC 059 of 21, late item, Chief Executive Officer Recruitment. Stand by just for a moment. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I would normally have a uh, declaration of interest to make. Uh, but as there is no report yet being prepared and I will not be in attendance at the OCM uh, on the uh, night, I have no declaration to make on this item. Thank you. So, councillors, that late item will be included in the ordinary uh, council meeting agenda, which will be published uh, towards the end of this week and circulated to councillors. We move to item um, CCD 034 of 21, 
the responsible officer being uh, Mr Graham Bride, the Director of Canning Development, and the report being initiation of scheme amendment number six to local planning scheme number 42, being 46 to 50 in brackets lot 326, Hartfield Street, Queen's Park, and lot five in brackets lot 414, uh, Godfrey Street in Queen's Park. The uh, recommendation is on page 31 of tonight's agenda and is on screen. Councillors, any questions in relation to that item? None. Thank you, councillors. We'll move on to CD 035 of 21, adoption of scheme amendment number three to local planning scheme number 42 for the property located at 105 Manning Road in brackets lot 999 Bentley. The recommendation is on page 41 of the agenda and is currently on screen. Councillors, any questions in relation to that uh, scheme amendment? Councillor Bain. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Will the city take into consideration Main Roads' uh, recommendation when the uh, DA is submitted? Director Bright. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, this is an interesting one where Main Roads were quite supportive of the increased density along Manning Road in terms of the corridor, transport corridor there. Um, they have suggested that a, a setback be applied at the development approval stage to ensure the Manning Road uh, reservation at that point is uh, 40 metres wide. Um, the city did actually, through its local planning scheme 42, suggest a re setback requirement for the whole length of Manning Road uh, to enable in, into the future a different range of transport alternatives, and that was uh, not supported by the Planning Commission. So to do it on an ad hoc basis without every single property uh, having that applied to them uh, would be difficult. So uh, it's something we can take offline uh, with the Department of Planning, but certainly um, it'd be difficult to apply it at an ad hoc basis without a, an overall um, framework. Councillor Bain, anything further? No, thank you. Any other questions, councillors, on that uh, item? Thank you. We move on to CD 036 of 21, the adoption of uh, scheme amendment number four to local planning scheme number 42, uh, property being 1096 Albany Highway in brackets lot 579 uh, St James. Any questions in relation to that scheme amendment? No questions, thank you. Uh, the next item is CD 038 of 21, the review of local government property and public places local law 2021 by Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation. The recommendation is on page 71 of the agenda and is also on screen. Councillors, any questions just in relation to that item? No questions, thank you. We move to EN 027 of 21. The responsible officer uh, is um, <coughs> Mrs Anita Primo. Uh, Ashley McKinnon is filling in for the acting director this evening. Uh, the uh, report title is Outcome of Liaison with State Agencies, Strategies to Alleviate Erosion and Improve Water Quality at Shelley Beach Park, Strategies to Increase Public Open Space in Shelley uh, and Ross Moyne. The recommendation is on page 71 of the agenda and is on screen uh, right now. Uh, councillors, are there any questions in relation to this item which relates to Mr Sewan's uh, earlier deputation? Uh, Councillor Holland. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I, I'm curious, with a substantive motion that was moved in May, part of that motion was to reinstate the eroded Riverbank, River Park, Kenning location and so on and so forth. And now in part two, you've got the request that the interim chief executive undertake, undertakes no further work. This was a council resolution. Can you, I, I'm not quite following this. Mr uh, Warren Bow, Director Bow. Uh, thank you, Mr <coughs> Mayor. Um, the substantive motion as amended from the 18th of May meeting uh, simply asked council to note that the motion that was passed at the general meeting of electors, Councillor Holland, uh, it didn't uh, instruct staff to undertake that action. It asked staff to note the motion that was carried at the general meeting of electors and to undertake certain actions as a result. In, in no way um, did we read the resolution by council that we would uh, undertake the reinstatement, merely investigate. Thank you for yes, clarifying that. Um, do you think this should be discussed a bit further with um, a SIP or anything like that? To get in, there's a real bone of contention here, obviously, with uh, the... Director Boat. 
Uh, certainly, Mr Mayor, if I could be frank, I, I believe that staff and the city has exhausted a significant amount of resources mm. in investigating this matter. Uh, we have, I personally have dealt with this matter since 2017. Uh, staff in my substantive program area have been dealing with the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions and the other relevant state agencies for a number of years on this, Councillor Holland, uh, and I believe that the significant report and the significant time invested by staff and provided to council tonight provides enough information for us to uh, draw a line under this, but that's simply our recommendation at this moment. Thank you, Councillor Holland. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm happy with that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any further questions on that item, councillors? None. Thank you. We move on to EN 028 of 21, the title of the uh, report being Parking Control, Tilly Place in Walshpool. The recommendation is on page 95 of the agenda and is on screen. Any questions? Fine. Thank you, Councillor Holland. No, that's OK. No need to apologise. Uh, we move on to EN 029 of 21, the report uh, title being Tender Award. Contract 15 oblique 2019 uh, in brackets category 2 FM.027.2 Coca Place Change Rooms Upgrades. Uh, the recommendation is on page 102 of the agenda and is on screen. Councillors, any questions in relation to that item? Councillor Spencer Teo? Yes, sorry, um, I didn't have a chance to find it back in the day, but can someone refresh my memory? Was the CSR double F funding, was that one of the third, a third, a third contributions to this? I uh, don't think it was, but I'll get uh, Mr McKinnon to answer the question. Uh, Councillor Spencer, too, it's a third and two thirds. It's so we're two thirds? Yep. Okay. Um, next question is, the, in the internal budget, it says the overall budget is 920, um, when originally we were looking at around about 750. Um, are we just getting really bad at estimates, or is the market just that bad at the moment? Um, Councillor uh, Spencer Terry, the budget for 920 includes staff time and related consultant costs. The actual tender award is um, for just under 800,000 within the tender pre-tender estimates. Uh, can, uh, Director Bo, did you want to add something to that? If I could, Mr Mayor. Um, certainly the, the feedback uh, from um, people we're, we're talking to in the sector is that um, in the last probably three months has been almost an 18% cost escalation across the building const and construction industry. Um, so whilst it may not have specifically affected this tender, we are experiencing some cost escalations even from quantity surveying estimates that were provided uh, three to four months ago. Thank you, Councillor Spencer Terry. So just to clarify, we've spent $120,000 of internal costs just on this one change room upgrade. Um, Councillor Spencer Teo, the budget includes uh, consultant costs and other related services, not just internal <coughs> staff time. And it's quite typical for large um, scale budgets uh, or large scale projects like this that we would have a proportion of costs allocated to these uh, items. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, I just have one of my own. Um, Mr McKinnon, just in relation to the report uh, being a tender, I note that the company directors aren't listed in here and I, I did look for the tender evaluation report which is in the large attachments and I really couldn't locate it. Um, have I missed that somewhere? Um, Ms. Uh, Mayor, the um, actual um, reports on the directors uh, should be in the report. If they're not, we'll forward them to the elected members. Um, okay. Terrific. Can we just make sure that's in the report if it's not? Uh, for the life of me, I couldn't actually uh, find it in there, so... Yeah, that's yeah, the normal that. practice, Mayor. Yep. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Councillors, we move on to um, EN 030 of 21, the report uh, title being Capital Works, Gibb Street, Railway Parade to Welshpool Road, East Cannington, Safe Active Street Project. The officer's recommendation is on page 112 of the agenda and is on screen. Any questions in relation to that? Item. I'll start with Councillor Hardeep Singh. Um, my question is, improvement, this project, <clears throat> in, 
involves improvement of Gibb Street by reducing traffic and making the street quieter. What impact it will have on Girard Street, which is parallel to Gibb Street, um, and highly likely people who are not going to use Gibb Street will use Girard Street to get in and out of the suburb. So has any consideration been given to that? Mr. McKinnon. Uh, Councillor Singh, uh, your due considerations is given to the traffic flow of, uh, or the traffic pattern after changing the street to a safe active street. Uh, and certainly we do look at the consequences of changing the traffic geometry uh, that lead to change in speed and, and people's behaviour. Uh, but if you like further information, I can call Officer Moore to provide more technical detail. Uh, Councillor Singh. Just regarding Gerard Street, uh, currently residents have complained about that the average speed on Gerard Street, uh, which vehicles are using, is 57 km per hour. It's a 50 zone. And city's requirement to actually do something about it is when that survey shows uh, a speed, average speed of over 10 km per hour, then some preventive measures uh, kick in place. So my point is, Residents who are living around Girard Street are already concerned about speeding and not enough preventive measures. With Gibbs Street getting quieter and a lot of improvement, which is great, I'm just concerned how much effect it will have on Girard Street particularly. Um, because it is right parallel to it and it is a main street. So any more information on that will be helpful. Mr. McKinnon. Um, certainly, Councillor Singh. Um, Officer Moore is here if you, if you wish a response you know, verbally. Otherwise, we can take that on notice and provide more detailed information to you uh, in print. I just had one question just before I go to Councillor uh, Spencer Teo. We did receive an internal memo recently which said that the works were to start in February uh, on this street, and that's uh, now been uh, recanted. But can I ask, has the city uh, signed any contracts for this? project? Have contracts already been signed for the project to proceed? Uh, may it, no. The, um, the works have been performed by the city and key contractors. But we haven't signed contractors uh, to agreements? I only say that because the matter is coming to Council for a decision on whether to proceed with the project, but it seems like it's already nine-tenths uh, uh, happening. We're pretty much about to put a shovel in the ground out there and um, um, we're being asked to make a 12-hour um, 11th hour decision on whether or not the project proceeds. The works are programmed, but because they're in our work schedule, we can um, be flexible about the time that we actually program the works. So we haven't signed contracts with external agencies. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Councillor Spencer, too. Um, yeah, I sent this question through to Anita, but she's on leave. So um, I believe we applied for this grant back in 2015 and we were unsuccessful. Um, and then back in April, we were successful, um, and then it came to a SIB in May. But did we, initially when we applied in 2015, was Gibbs Street identified as the street that we wanted this project, or was it we'll get back to you at a later date with a nominated place? Mr McKinnon. Uh, Councillor Spencer, TO Gibbs Street, there were several nominated, but Gibbs Street was a preferred street. Back in 2015? Uh, the actual date, I'll just check with Officer Moore. Mr Moore, are you able to provide um, an answer to that question? If you're not able to, that's OK. We'll take it on notice. Good evening, councillors and via the Mayor. Um, in 2015, the City did make application with the Department of Transport as part of their WABN program. Um, at that point in time, the cycling and walking plan for the city was not endorsed. Uh, we had proposed a shed path down the Gerrard Street corridor as part of that application. Um, we were unsuccessful at that time and the Department of Transport continued to negotiate and work with the city. Uh, we continue uh, extensive stakeholder uh, engagement with the Department of Transport and maintain a relationship with them to make sure that we are uh, best position to deliver the outcomes for the city from the cycling and walking plan and understand the motivations and the drivers of their own programs. So we are best positioned when the funding opportunities do come available. This project uh, received funding after the project had been endorsed in the cycling and walking plan as a safe active street. Thanks Mr Moore. Councillor Spencer Teo. But was, so from what I get from that, Gibbs Street wasn't 
identified back then, but with the negotiation throughout the last six years, it's kind of evolved. Is that correct? Mr. Moore, is that basically what I'm trying to understand? Was Gibbs Street was Gibbs Street always the street that we identified as being the safe street? So for the the safe active street project. Gibbs Street has always been always. the safe okay. active street corridor and that is adopted based on the cycling and walking plan yep. and the 2019 schedule to deliver a safe active street for Gibbs Street corridor which was endorsed by council. Right. So did we reapply back in earlier this year or was it part of the negotiation with um, Department of Transport that we were able to meet their criteria and they said right now it's all good let's go? By and large yes that's correct. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Singh. Well, uh, I, I would like to have the verbal response as offered uh, about the effects of this project on Gerard Street. Thank you. Uh, noted, Councillor Singh. We will come back to you. Noted. We'll get that distributed. Mr. Bow. Oh, Mr. Moore. Sorry. Mr. Moore, are you able to provide a response in relation to Gerard Street? Did you actually hear the uh, question from Councillor Singh? Uh, he was worrying about uh, or asking a question in relation to the implications on traffic flow on Gerard Street. Yeah, that's fine. So, uh, effectively, we're dealing with a 2.2 long, 2.2-kilometre uh, long uh, road transport corridor here. The redistribution of traffic that we're anticipating to occur is on the uh, about 600 vehicles per day across that entire road corridor. A lot of that redistribution will occur because people choose not to rat run via that street. So the actual distribution of traffic to homes along that street is very different. Um, the Gerrard Street corridor is an arterial road uh, through the city. It has a bridge which runs over the top of the railway uh, and has a, an important transport function. So its ability to cater for the additional volume is well and truly within its uh, capacity at the moment. Uh, with regards to the speeding comments that you've referred to earlier, recent developments on that corridor have occurred to introduce traffic calming in and around the Gibbs Street Primary School near the niche living development which Council contributed towards um, and further monitoring of that corridor would obviously occur post a project like this should it be endorsed to ensure that any impact that this project had on surrounding road networks was mitigated post the project should that occur. At this stage we don't believe that, that it will be because it is sufficiently low in volume that we're simply not anticipating major uh, follow on effect. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Singh. Councillor Bain, you've got your hand up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. <clears throat> Has a formal traffic impact assessment been conducted? Uh, Mr McKinn. Uh, traffic assessments are conducted around the traffic flow uh, with projects like Gibbs Street. Um, and we've responded in that, that fashion. Officer Moore can provide more detail on the actual traffic assessments that were done. The formal traffic assessment around uh, Gibbs Street itself was not done. It's not required as part of that um, project. And would it be possible just to um, just expand in regard to the rationale behind putting the cul-de-sac on the end of Gibbs Street before Wilshire Road? Mr McKinnon. Uh, Councillor Bain, the, the um, creation of the cul-de-sac is one of the elements to reduce speed and provide that local community nature to the road as part of that uh, the cycling walking plan and, and the DOT um, guidance in terms of safe active streets. However, um, there are several alternative treatments which we have looked at um, since the cul-de-sac and since discussion with local residents and we've moved to a slightly alternative treatment to a cul-de-sac which the elected members would now be aware of. Thank you. The Thank you, Mr McKinnon. Any further questions on uh, that item, councillors? None. Thank you. We will move on to EN031 of 21. Uh, Mr. Primo picked a great meeting not to attend. <laughs> she dodged a bullet. She did. She's <laughs> having a well-earned rest. Uh, EN031 of 21, uh, the title of this report being late item, Local Roads and Community Infrastructure, uh, the LRCI Program uh, Extension. The recommendation is on page two uh, of the circulated late agenda and is on screen uh, right now. Councillors, any questions in regards to that item? Uh, no questions? Oh, Councillor Spencer, Teo. I've got a few, so strap yourself in. Um, 
With phase one and phase two of this funding, um, we funded quite a few playgrounds. Um, given that there's no funding sources um, and the extended funding sources for playgrounds, um, and the acquittal time for this particular um, phase has been extended, why haven't any playground renewals been suggested as part of this phase? Uh, Mr McKinnon. Uh, Councillor Spencer Tia, are you referring to phase two projects? Yes. Yep. Uh, so, in regard to phase two, uh, most of the projects are fully committed. However, due to um, the particular project on centenary noted as not being viable now and the redistribution of those funds to um, the alternative, um, the view was that storage was a primary concern for sports clubs and that uh, an, a new facility. Uh, Elvieta Shed is um, appropriate for Centenary given the lighting project was not, was actually for Centenary and therefore uh, it felt it was a reasonable transition of funds to that and also to other projects that required additional funds. Councillor? Okay, so sorry, that was, yeah, I was, sorry, the, um, what I meant was previous monies that we've received through this grant fund, we have spent on playgrounds. So I'm just wondering why, out of this $1.7 million, why there's no playground suggested for renewal in this? Um, certainly. So, Councillor Spencer, are you referring to Phase 3 funds, yes, which yeah. are the most recent? So um, the administration's view was that in light of the market catalyzed survey, the predominant need from community was active sports, storage, lighting as predominant um, themes given that phase one had been entirely devoted to playgrounds. Okay, um, another question. Um, wouldn't HOSAC be eligible for some CRFF funding if we were to um, make that a priority? Mr McKinnon. Uh, Councillor Spencer, are you referring to the change rooms? Yes. Or? Yes, uh, in fact they're noted as being eligible and they're uh, in the process of being submitted for CSRFF funding. So would we reduce the amount of this phase three funding if we were successful with the CRWF funding for this, or would we drop our application? Uh, two points. The phase three funding that's allocated to this project is uh, in view of obtaining the CSRWF funding. Um, if the funding was not successful, we would have to redirect the funding. In that case, then, what is the total um, spend on HOSAC? If it's got 1.26 here, would that be another few hundred thousand with the CR, CSRWF? Uh, yes, in the detail of the report uh, in the box relating to HOSAC, um, it notes the total funding uh, of being 1680 okay. uh, as opposed to the 1280. So it notes the proportion of fundings that are CSRFF funding. Right. Um, with the Riverton and Hossack upper lights, um, Riverton, the design is already in the budget 22-23, um, and Hossack's already in 2021, the design with the building 22-23. So in my mind, these have already been budgeted for. Is that correct, Mr McKinnon? Uh, the, the budget for 22-23 is not the approved budget. But so it's, we've kind of got that earmarked, don't it's, we? Technically, it's in the Ford Capital Works. Um, LRCI funds can be applied to all, uh, all projects which are not currently approved budget items. Okay. Um, so with recommendation number three for the centenary park um, storage and everything, does that include the removal or demolition of the building which um, contains asbestos that's sitting on the car park as well? Mr McKinnon. The uh, Councillor Spencer Teo, the erection of the new shed at centenary would be on the same pad as the existing building. The existing building would be demolished. Um, with asbestos removed as part of the, any any resonant asbestos removed as part, if there are still, uh, would be removed as part of that demolition. And that's included in that estimate? That, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, and has Ben Morton or Steve Irons given any indication um, of projects that they'd like to be supported through this funding round? Uh, no, I can't spare. Uh, not today. 
Okay. Um, uh, sorry, I would, uh, I'll take that back, sorry. Uh, in the body of the report, there is a note uh, in relation to the Federal Minister uh, for Tagney, Ben Morton, who has indicated a preference for the Restrata facility to be expanded. And the city's response to that is noted in the clause. Thank you. And finally, um, with item four, with some money being left over to the Willerton Bowling Club fence, I keep hearing a lot of people say that we're not going to be spending any more money in the Willerton Sports Precinct, but we keep finding these little things propping up. Um, would it be possible to get a list of what is left over in that area? Because it's keeps projects that haven't been completed. Projects yet. that are, you know, in mind that haven't been completed that may come up for this type of thing because like I said um, I keep hearing that's it we're done and clearly we're not. <laughs> uh, Councillor Spencer Teo we can certainly provide that information. Um, verbally there is some CCTV that is currently budgeted to be um, implemented at the site. There is some signage, uh, entry signage and um, signage around the site that needs to be completed. Uh, there is the Willerton um, Bowls Club Fence, which is an LRCI funded project, which requires additional funds as noted in the report. Uh, the, and the other remaining item is the lighting for the southern and middle ovals, which is due to be implemented from January through to April um, next year. Was there a large screen going into the area as well? I heard. Uh, Talk about an LED, a large screen or something? When, uh, Mayor, when the building was, uh, the Willerton Stadium was erected, the city provided some funds for the installation of a substructure and wiring for a large LED screen similar to the Riverton Leisureplex LED screen. But we did not include or um, direct to include the actual LED screen. The cost for the LED screen uh, is significant and it was planned as a longer term future works. But we, the idea was that we would have all of the substructure and wiring in place when the building was built. And it is, so the wiring? It is, it is. It is. yes, okay. including okay. sub-metering. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Bain, you had a question? Oh, Councillor Spencer Teo, sorry, you're finished? I'm done, thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Bain. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Mr Mayor. In regard to uh, Centenary Park uh, sports lighting, uh, it was estimated that stage one would cost $700,000 to complete, uh, but obviously it's been uh, cancelled. But as we can see on the board, uh, Hossack Park Sports Lighting is 960. Why wouldn't we go ahead with stage one at Centenary Park? It is, it is possible. The issue, uh, Councillor Bain, the issue with Centenary Park is the extent of the asbestos. Asbestos was discovered quite close to the surface and we hit significant hard surfaces which includes um, possible car bodies and the like. So the cost, in terms of the cost escalation on a project of that nature became too uncertain for the city and we would opt to provide lighting where our costings could be more certain. Councillor Bain. Why... If that being the case, why wouldn't we, could we not upgrade the existing lights that are there to LED? Seems that we have committed to the project, the community is expecting it to occur, and nothing's happening. Is there any way to repurpose the current infrastructure? Uh, Councillor Bain and Mayor, no. The existing pole structures are not, and the wiring is not uh, adequate for the new lighting, and in particular the controls are relate to that lighting. Uh, the, the lux is quite, or the intensity of the lighting, the type of lighting, the spread of lighting and the head assembly is quite different from the old poles and they need to be of a different height as well. Councillor Bain. Paragraph uh, 43, the PAW lighting program, it says it's citywide, um, but in the, uh, in the paragraph 43, it just says it's in Parkwood, is that correct? Mr. McKinn, paragraph 43 of the report. Uh, Councillor Bain, the PAW uh, lighting, the $500,000 for PAW lighting, 
is citywide. So if there is a mistake, uh, I haven't looked through it yet, it, uh, I'll correct it now. Thank you, Councillor Bone. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, so for suburb, it has listed there Parkwood. Um, with the, when considering uh, the options for funding here, were the facilities at Ferndale Reserve, did they come into the conversation at any point? Yes, Mr McKinnon. The facilities at Ferndale uh, were not documented and, and not ready. Uh, also, the facilities at Ferndale were subject to further evaluation in terms of hubbing and um, the nature and type of the facilities. It was decided within the time frame of the window for LRCI funding that it was possible to construct and build HOSAC, but not Ferndale. Councillor Sweeney. Yeah, thank you. If we could just go back to Centenary Park. Um, and the, the building works that are proposed there. How much um, has been allocated to asbestos removal? Mr McKinnon. Uh, we've made a provisional sum. I would have to come back to you. I'll take that on notice. I'll take that on notice, Councillor Sweeney. Thank you. Can I just ask uh, myself, I'll come to you in just a moment, Councillor Singh. How are we proposing to address the issues at um, Centenary Park? It's such a, a beautiful and extraordinarily large um, open space and much used by um, the community, but um, with the issues we have around contamination out there, at some stage we need to bite the bullet. We're going to have to have, uh, there are going to be works there for, I don't know, irrig irrigation that will have similar issues if we ever have to dig the place up to put uh, large scale upgrades to irrigation in that centre. Uh, we've got clubs there as Councillor Bain um, has brought up uh, that are, you know, we're looking forward to and uh, have been in line for this wonderful improvement. How do we address it in the long term? I mean, we, ha we have to do something at some stage. I'm wondering what the forward plan is. Uh, Mr Mayor, the, the city would need to um, budget for funds to create um, more extensive geotechnical, geotechnical work in evaluating the ground, particularly around the level of and type of contamination across the whole and breadth of the oval and the associated areas. We have some experience from doing the capping works on West Centenary and also Centenary Avenue. The extent of fibrous asbestos, both blue and white, uh, is spread throughout the area to our knowledge, but will require significant external consulting resources, which we would need to budget for. Mr CEO, can I, can I just suggest perhaps uh, that uh, we do consider this as a provisional sum in the upcoming budget? Uh, I think we just have to address it in some way, or at least uh, have Council advised of what's going on out there. Mr CEO. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. That's uh, one reason why <coughs> Council needs to finalise and adopt its contaminated site strategy. Mm. So the contaminated site strategy would step through a two-phase, three-phase process for dealing for these things with a preliminary site inspection followed by a detailed site inspection that would show you all the, all the works required and then for funding. Uh, if you are aware at this stage the contaminated sites reserve does not have a specific reserve allocation allocated to it. It is intended to have a transfer of funds from the waste uh, reserve. But the first project we have to deal with is the uh, existing site, which is our landfill site, our old landfill site, and that project alone is some $10 million estimate at this point in time for rectification works. So we have a couple of very significant liabilities in the nearest area, which is why we need to finish that strategy and fund it and then bring these matters back before Council. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Singh, you had a question? Thank you, Mr Mayor. My question is regarding Item 1B, Queen's Park Reserve Sports Storage. Uh, about 500,000 uh, funds. Are there any other items which are eligible for this funding within Queen's Park Reserve? Mr McKinnon. Uh, Councillor Singh, the um, Harry Turner Pavilion extension was um, uh, designed for um, the ability to provide for the storage for a club to have a site uh, or a home base. Um, and that was considered um, a priority as opposed to local amenity improvements of which a number of our POS facilities do require across the city. Uh, the, as I'd mentioned earlier, the focus is on sports club storage um, in line with community um, survey results. Follow-up question is, is this the most important, uh, well, 
is this the most needed item in Queen's Park Reserve right now? Are there any, is there anything else which is needed more than the sports storage which could use these funds better and are eligible as per this scheme? Have we done any work on that? Just asking about the priority process. Uh, Councillor Singh, the, the prioritisation process is usually worked through with the various clubs and community groups within the city and also relies on surveys of the community in terms of what the predominant needs are. Uh, we also look to our asset management planning in terms of the renewal and extension of facilities provide for the, uh, the needs of sports clubs and the growth of sports clubs as we have done for change rooms and gender equality change rooms. Um, so that's our guiding principles. Dr McQuaid, are you able to provide any information specifically around the Harry Turner Pavilion and why that's been promoted? Probably, yes. I'm <laughs> sorry, Mr Mayor. Uh, firstly, I guess just to, to comment on um, work has recommenced in earnest on the community infrastructure plan and mapping all community facilities and community assets um, and <coughs> picking up on previous community engagement that was done with the clubs and, and sporting users so that we can and do understand what the requirements are. And, and, and on that, I would say to you that storage is actually quite close to becoming the number one issue that is coming to us from all of our clubs. There's a, a deficiency in storage across most of our reserves, so that is of high priority. Um, and yes, in terms of Hossack Park, it is the, the storage needs and the upgrade of the change rooms are definitely priorities in that particular space. Um, and sports storage for uh, Harry Turner Pavilion is, is where the need is at. Councillor Singh. I understand if we ask a sports club, definitely their priority will be storage space. Have we considered the feedback from people living around the park and people who are using the park, not, not for sports purposes, to visit in the evening, uh, people who come to uh, walk their dog, other park users, not just the sports club. Is this the most important item which gives us value for money for that park? Mr McKinnon. Uh, certainly, Councillor Singh, we did consider a number of community facilities. Um, the Queen's Park Reserve was one of those. Um, and ultimately, at the end, we have to choose a number of um, projects given the 1.766 million cap. And um, so it, it unfortunately missed out on that, in, but it was one of the items we did look at. Can I, can I ask a question, Mr McKinnon, if yep. you don't mind? I just, uh, I'm just looking at the cost of it, um, but, but I'll get to that in a moment. In relation to the sports storage at Queen's Park, is that always also picking up uh, a need identified fairly recently by the, I think it was the uh, Tamil Cricket uh, Club at that same reserve? Is that, who was using the uh, sports storage there at Queen's Park Reserve? Who is that going to be used by? Yeah. Mr Mayor, the, the sports storage would be used by the Tamil Cricket Club, that's correct. Okay. And other users as well? I believe so, yeah. Can I just ask in relation to that, and only because it's been raised a number of times fairly recently, um, have, are, we, are we looking at um, other building materials and solutions for building um, things like storage is a fairly simple use. Uh, and I know on the eastern uh, seaboard and even here at um, uh, the northern pavilion at uh, Burundar Reserve, we've used um, sea containers there. We've repurposed sea containers and built them into a fantastic storage facility uh, up the back there. Half a million dollars for st uh, storage for sports equipment. I'm just wondering, maybe this is a ship that's already sailed, but are we looking at other uh, other other materials and, and better value for money propositions for things as simple as sports storage? Uh, Mr Mayor, certainly the city administration, particularly the architecture department, is constantly looking at different um, building methodologies and particularly around sustainability and uh, cost effectiveness in building. It is not always the case that converting um, sea containers is the most actual cost effective way to construct. It really depends on the context. Um, but we do look at what is most um, effective, cost effective, and also what most suitable for the circumstance, particularly around asset uh, renewal. Thank you. Director McQuaid. Just further to that, as part of our work with the Community Infrastructure Plan, it will be our intent to also develop some guidelines around um, what is going to be standard provision of sports storage and change rooms going forward for the city so that we can move to a more standardised approach 
that would look at number of clubs utilising it, space requirements in line with code um, allocations and so on and so forth. So it will be our intent to put a little bit more of a process around that, that we can be very clear with all our sporting and community groups on what we will allocate in the future. Terrific. OK, thank you. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Spencer TO first and I'll come back to Councillor Seat. Have any of these clubs that have been recommended um, got any money or have offered to put any money into these projects or are these fully funded through us and these grants? Mr McKinnon. These projects are fully funded by the city through the LRCI program. Councillor Singh. I'm still struggling to understand <clears throat> the priority of sports storage given that the cricket nets, so this sports storage has been requested by a cricket club. The cricket nets in Queen's Park Reserve, they are in bad shape and they are much less of an expense to upgrade. Another example is the basketball court is half a court in the same reserve and at a very bad location, hardly gets used in a bad shape. So how are upgrading those facilities are not a priority, which is again sports, can be used by local community for playing, especially by local kids, but providing the storage for the same sport is coming up as higher priority. Um, so this is, I'm, I'm struggling to understand. I just, any more information on that will be helpful. Well, so, I might get you to send some information through. So just in relation to this item here, uh, I guess essentially you've asked the question mostly around how we prioritise these projects. So maybe some general information in relation to that would be helpful just so the new councillors understand uh, how we actually arrive at how the city arrives at these priority decisions? Uh, certainly, Mr Mayor, we can provide um, written guidance to the way that we prioritise those decisions for the LRCI program. Yeah. And it will be helpful if you can please, especially regarding Queen's Park Reserve, all the work which was done to prioritise, how this came to the decision, I would like to understand it. It will be helpful. Uh, Councillor Singh, certainly we can do that. Um, Thank you. Any other questions on item? Councillor Holland? Uh, Mr Mayor, I've got a bit of concern about Centenary Avenue. Um, mm -hmm. We found um, the asbestos down there. What's our OH&S responsibilities here now that we know about it and we're letting people play on it every single day of the week? Uh, Director, uh, sorry, Mr McKinnon. Adjust your microphone, Councillor. Um, Councillor Holland, the ovals as they are are quite safe. They have uh, capping on them. Um, the issue arises when work is done on the ovals and digging takes place to a depth which exposes the subsoil into which the asbestos is resident. What sort of capping have we put on it, the same as we did with East? Mr McKinnon. Uh, the capping on the west was 300 mil with 150 mil overlay of soil. Um, the capping on the east, the current playing surface on the east side is historical and I would not know the exact depth of overlay, but it would be, uh, I don't know, we'd have to take that on notice. And yeah, We can't dig down to find out. I, I understand um, with the budget constraints and especially with Ranford as well, but um, shouldn't we, besides um, allocating funds to fix the whole problem, shouldn't we be investigating now on what the what the situation's going to be for the future? Like Director. you were saying, Mr Mayor, I can't see how we... We've got an obligation here. We know there's asbestos here. We've got a responsibility to sort out at some stage. Do you think, Mr Mayor, if I could just um, um, remind uh, the elected members and, and advise the uh, recently elected elected members. In June this year, we presented at a, at a strategic issues briefing about the contaminated sites plan, and we identified Centenary East um, for a preliminary site investigation this financial year with a detailed site investigation next financial year. So we're talking about $50,000 estimate for the PSI and 100000 next financial year for the DSI, the detailed uh, site investigation, but as uh, the interim CEO indicated, um, you know, the priority project for the city is uh, the um, ameliorating the contaminated sites issues emanating from the former landfill site at Ranford Road. Thank you. Councillor Holland. Just to refresh me, what, has Ranford got asbestos? Director. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I didn't quite catch that question, Councillor Holland. Holland. 
Um, just to refresh me, has um, Ranford got asbestos? Are we worried about asbestos there as well? Uh, yeah, Director we are, Councillor Holland. Um, as a former landfill site, we know there's um, a significant amount of asbestos in there, but that's not um, the only thing we're worried about there. And there's also been some historic um, you know, surface asbestos discovered on the, on the former landfill site. Thank you. Thank you, Councillors. Uh, we'll move on. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Sweeney. Just getting back on uh, what um, Councillor Holland just said. So um, through you, Mr Mayor, to Mr Bo, are we saying that um, the integrity of the capping that's in place at the moment at Centenary Park, uh, is that integrity, um, um, is it questionable? Is, are we unclear, are we unsure about the integrity of the current capping that was placed originally? Director. Uh, we're far more uh, confident in the capping we put at Centenary West, uh, but we're satisfied that Centenary East poses no immediate health risk, but it does warrant um, the further preliminary and detailed site investigations. And that's coming back to council at some stage? Yeah. Absolutely, Mr yeah. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, councillors. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, next item. Thank you. The next item is uh, item 7.5. Uh, Director Sarah McQuaid is the uh, responsible officer, the director of uh, Canning Community. It's CO009 of 21, proposed policy, use of monitoring technology, CSO3. The recommendation is on page 127 of tonight's agenda and is also on screen. Are there any questions? Councillor Holland. Yeah, Mr Mayor, first of all, I'm, I'm curious at how policy CSO2 does not align with the WA Police State CCTV strategy. Can you explain uh, that to me? You wanted to, yep. Councillor, uh, sorry, um, Director McQuaid. I'll ask Mr Shane Mallon, uh, Manager of Canning Safety, <laughs> Strategy and Safety, to... Mr Shane Mallon, thank you. Uh, yeah, through you, Mr Mayor. Uh, the main uh, non-alignment is that the strategy is focused on public facing and our current policy is focused on asset management. Councillor Holland. So why does that worry us whether if they're um, in public strategy, why does it worry whether we align with the WA Police State CCD strategy or not? Uh, Mr Mallon. Yeah, through you, Mr Mayor, uh, because alignment with the state strategy enables us to be uh, eligible for grant funding opportunities. So while we're not aligned to the strategy for public facing and public realm, uh, we limit our ability to be eligible for state government or, and federal um, grant funding. Councillor Holland. Well, from what I understand, when I first came on to Cancer, we were offered um, federal government funding. And this was on the old policy. We were offered by um, uh, Steve Irons, and we declined it. Mr Mellon. Yes, I'm not sure at, in what year you're referencing. However, um, our ability to comply with those requirements is impeded by the fact that our current policy does not allow us to move into the public realm beyond our current policy, which has limited ability to do that. Uh, that said, that's not saying the city hasn't received grant funding. We've been able to do that where we've been able to show that uh, cameras on our current assets uh, have some visibility into the public realm, uh, but that, that's picked up as part of the periphery of the cameras that are on our assets. Councillor Holland, any further yeah, questions? Yeah, I've got a few. Um, the one thing is with the community safety um, to investigate offences for which local government has the legislative responsibility for enforcement. Um, can you give me some examples of that? Uh, Director McQuaid. Excuse me, Mr Mallon. Look at Director McQuaid. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Mr Mayor. Um, so examples for that would be um, dogs off leash. That is in, within our legislative responsibility. However, again, we need to ensure that where we place our uh, mobile units is pointed towards a, a city asset, so we have to be strategic in that sense if we were looking to use it in that example. So anything that sits within the city's local laws would be an example of where it is within our legislative responsibility. So Council. we're saying that we'll put uh, cameras in there just so we can get a couple of dogs that are off leash, leash that are not on council land? Oh, I don't think that's what... Director McQuaid was saying, but... No, that's not what I was saying. I was just giving you an example as you asked for an example of what our legislative responsibility would be. That is one example. Another thing you've got down here to support safety and efficiency providing the geolog geographical location of city staff, that's the monitoring part. Haven't we got that with GPS anyway? 
Uh, Director McQuaid. Yes, we do have that uh, already. And as we've said before, uh, at present, we have no governing policy for that. It is managed through staff employee contracts. But we've got GPS in the trucks and the vehicles anyway. Uh, but that's done through a management agreement, not through, uh, not through policy and guidance. Is that right? That's correct. There's no governing policy around what the city can and can do in that space. We do it through our own uh, operational and contracts. Um, the other part, thank you for your indulgence, Mr Mayor, where we've got down to um, three, the objectives, we've got community safety, this is not in um, option one, you've got crossed out to facilitate and improve decision making operational outcomes through the collection of relevant data, that's in B1 and B3, uh, no B2, C, you'll get that later, C2 and C3, and in um, option two, they're there. Does that mean if we take option one, then you're not going to be using it like in the better services area to facilitate improved decision making, but it will be in the, the option two? I don't quite see how, why some have been um, crossed out, especially like environmental sustainability, to gather information that enables an improved understanding of localised environmental factors is crossed out on one, but in the other. And I'm not sure how CCTV um, works in that respect either. Uh, Director McQuaid. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Um, firstly, the, the amendments that were made to the policy following the May 2019 uh, policy, draft policy that was put to Council was in response to feedback provided by elected members both during that round of meetings and subsequent to that. Um, we have in the amended version that is before Council, we have focused it, focused it specifically around how we primarily use CCTV as opposed to other monitoring technologies and the references in the uh, original version were in relation very much to our smart city initiatives. Uh, as you would no doubt recall, uh, at the time smart city initiatives were high on our agenda. Uh, we had council support to look at being a leader in the way in which we use data and data analytics and so the original policy was very much written around that because currently there is no policy that governs how we undertake our smart city initiatives and so at the time it was thought that there was a prime opportunity to bring in our CCTV and our monitoring technologies into one policy and look at how we do that. So hence uh, why the scope was broader in the original but has been like, paired back in the secondary given council's concerns around how we might use data. So in the but if, if, for example, if option one was undertaken, then we would have a automatic, um, automated facial recognition. Is that correct? Dr McQuaid. At no point in time has the city administration ever advocated to use automated facial recognition. Uh, as I'm aware, all the presentations that we have presented to council have spoke, spoken about the use of IoT technologies, which is in generally around uh, the, the data collection and monitoring of environmental sensitivities, water protection, traffic management, so on and so forth. Uh, it doesn't require facial recognition. In the original policy as presented in May 2019, we didn't mention anything around facial technology. It's effectively silent on it. In the amended version, and I think in response to it's a notion count, heard by... It's by actually councils, councils actually raised it. And from memory, it was yourself and Councillor Barry, perhaps. They raised, you, you raised it. You wanted it expressly taken out of it, just in case there was any chance that the city might introduce it. You wanted it specifically taken out of any future policy. So, and so councillors introduced the terminology about facial recognition. The city had never proposed it. No, uh, and that's so, not the point sorry, I'm trying to make. In option two, you haven't got that. In option one, you've got the use of automatic facial is specifically excluded, but you haven't got that in option two. So if we vote for option two, it could be there. Is, is that correct? Or Dr McQuaid. We specifically put the wording in to the amended version in response to concerns raised by elected members. It wasn't in the original version, and that is what we've sent to you. Uh, the question I've put to my staff and the executive have asked is in, in what realm would the city even need to use automated facial techni techni technology? We don't believe we would, uh, but it is very easy for council if they were to move to support the May 2019 original draft to have 
that reference that is appearing in the amended draft inserted into the second draft. Sorry, it's confusing because we've got two drafts, I apologise. <laughs> That's why I was trying to get the clarity on it. That was more than anything else because I couldn't. And also on the second draft, on the first one, it's got monitoring technology shall not be used for the intentional recording. On the second one, it's taken out the word intentional. Why would you just take it out? I don't understand. Director McQuaid. I'll ask Mr Mallon to address that because... Mr Mallon. Through you, Mr Mayor, that was actually um, recommended by you uh, and endorsed by uh, Council as an amendment at one of the sessions that we brought to Council. Uh, the green wording, the intentional recording, um, is, is my recollection, and the, and the preclusion of facial recognition was actually um, a suggestion by yourself. Have I just been thrown under the bus, CEO? Is that what just happened here? Live? I was yeah, live. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any further questions, Councillor Holland? No, thank you, Mr. Okay, any further questions? Uh, Deputy uh, Councillor, um, what's your name again, Councillor Jacobs? Sorry. <laughs> um, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to um, cover off, we've mentioned that my recollection was facial recognition, we excluded that. And also plate recognition, is that my understanding correct? That my understanding is that we'll just capture the, the raw data and if we need to refer it to the police, they'll actually then use their softwares. Is that is my understanding correct? I, th I think there's been some misinformation around how the city might use the uh, recognition of uh, and what we can actually access. Director McQuaid. Yeah, so with regards to facial recognition, it is a software that uh, as plate, opposed... Plate recognition. Oh, he asked on both, oh, so I'll address both. With the facial recognition, uh, it is a software that overlays, so it's not done through the initial capturing of CCTV footage. Um, and yes, as we've said, it is not in our intent to do that. Um, police, when they request our footage, are able to do that themselves. Um, with regards to number plate recognition, similar applies. Again, um, I don't believe that it was ever in any of the feedback we got that we were asked to explicitly exclude it, but again, uh, whether we would use it. The only time in my time at the city that we have put uh, anything to council around considering using um, plate recognition technology was in relation to our Canning Vale Smart Industrial Areas project where we were looking to do a pilot to um, measure and track traffic movements through Canning Vale so that we could then inform future road network provision and infrastructure provision so that we were safeguarding the industrial area of Canning Vale. We didn't go ahead with that project. However, uh, main roads have been doing something similar and they obviously have that data to hand. Yes, Councillor. So my understanding is that we don't intend to use it, but we haven't specifically ruled out that we could use plate recognition, is that right? We, it's not in there at the moment, no. So, Last question, Mr Mayor, thank you. So if we wanted, it could be put in as an amendment, perhaps next week to say, you know, explicitly rule that out, that we wouldn't do that, would that be possible? You could, yeah. however, the city already does it because we do it with our own fleet of vehicles. Um, and so to preclude it in this policy, we would then need to have a look at the flow and effects because we do do it with all of our fleet. So we could say like, we could, and say we use it for our own stuff but don't use it for anybody else? You could. My question to, for Council to consider would be why would it be necessary? Uh, in this day and age, we know that every, my main roads are collecting your data every day. Uh, you go to a service station, they're collecting your data every day. You go through a McDonald's drive through they're capturing your number plate every day. The city, as I've said, doesn't have a need to. However, if we're to be a leader, in the smart city space and in the use of data and data analytics to inform smart decisions on our road infrastructure and our road network, we need to consider the implications of making a decision to preclude it without considering what the long-term uh, loss might be. Can I just ask uh, just two questions? Because there's been some really serious, um, I think, assumptions made in the community and some misinformation. One was in relation to number plate recognition. My understanding is that the City of Kenning, uh, if it introduced a policy which allowed it at some stage to consider number plate recognition, 
We cannot access the personal details of private citizens. We have limited access to limited data uh, through a third party agreement with Main Roads or, or another agency. Am I correct? Yes, you are correct. Okay. The second thing, so we, we can't ever see personal details of any driver. We can only see vehicle data. Is that right? Size of the vehicle, make of the vehicle. That's correct. That's right. The other thing in the policy that was raised uh, publicly recently was in relation to the sale of data to third party uh, third parties. Now, my understanding from reading uh, the policy is that has never been entertained, not ever, uh, during this policy. We were looking at um, the only mention about uh, data and third parties uh, would, I believe, mean that if we needed to provide data to a third party, i.e. Western Australian Police, for instance, uh, we could then do that under the policy, share that data in certain, certain circumstances, um, contingent on the, I think, the act or, or the guidance provided by the policy. Is that what we're talking about, uh, releasing data to third parties? Because there's been a misconception that we're looking at selling data. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I have recently provided all elected members with the CEO instruction on CCTV management guidelines that currently exists. Those guidelines stipulate that the only mechanism for members of the public to access our CCTV footage is an application in accordance with Freedom of Information Act. Further, that with regards to police or other law enforcement agencies, they can request a copy of the footage. They must do so in writing um, for the purposes of investigation of possible criminal activity. So the CEO instruction already specific, specifically states what we can and cannot do in regards to the sharing of data and that is as far as we go with the sharing. So yes, you're correct. Okay, thank you. Councillor Holland. Just a couple of points going on from that. You were saying, look, yeah, we can't access the information on number plate recognition. Then why the hell are we doing it? Why are we doing it? Yeah, we don't, you don't need to have a number plate recognition to see the size of a truck. Well, for the, for the exact... Well, I'm not sure that you know that, but for the reason outlined earlier around Kenningvale. Uh, it was abandoned, which is the main roads issue well, anyway. It was abandoned, I think, because we didn't have a policy that allowed us to do it at the time. Director McQuaid. Yes, that's right. That's why we didn't do it. Main roads did it. Um, effectively, it's the number plate gives the data of the make and model of the vehicle. The CCTV is not going to pick up, given the scope of the field of view, the entire vehicle, and someone has to go through and watch it. So you don't get the name and the ownership details, but what we can get through Main Roads, in our agreement with Main Roads, is the make, model, type of vehicle that's using the, the traffic, using the um, road infrastructure at that time. So we already so have... through the number plate recognition, we can get the make and model. So that would have to come from the Department of Transport, wouldn't it? We already have an agreement in place, is that what you're saying, no, with Main Roads? I believe it's through Main Roads, not direct through the Department of Transport. We can only access the but information... The Department of Transport the only ones who've got that information. Main Roads don't have it. I'm not sure, but maybe they've got... No, they don't. The other, the other thing is that with the, the privacy on it, just how secure is it? Because, like you're saying, misinformation, Mr Mayor, there was things on Facebook recently saying, oh, look, and give me 10 minutes and I can get into a camera. How secure are we with that? And they said, this is how you do it, go and do that, and it's easy. Director how secure McCoy. is it? Uh, so, we're getting into quite technical and our manager of ICT is not here, but as you are aware, the city has very robust um, ICT um, systems and firewalls and so on and so forth and backup systems. Um, we have um, protocols around how people utilise information. So from a actually hacking into the service, I believe that we have a very robust system in that sense. From the city's um, internal point of view, uh, there are only a limited handful of number of officers that actually have access to the CCTV footage. Um, we have a list of who those people are. And the only time that we actively look at the footage is in the response. So we aren't proactively monitoring um, the capturing. We've never done that. But when there has been an instance, then when we're responding to that, we go back and we pinpoint and look at the data at that point in time. We will be using it to monitor, um, I thought it's set in here, um, the geographical locations of staff, though. Again, uh, we're doing that, as I understand, I could be wrong, but we're doing that on as needs basis. So, uh, for example, if we have had a complaint from a resident around perhaps one of our range of vehicles being 
parked in an area for an extended period of time, then we can go back and look at the GPS data of that vehicle to ascertain where that vehicle was on its route and cross-track that with our service logs. Uh, we don't proactively sit and watch how that happens. Um, and uh, how long will we keep the data for, like the tapes as it were? Is it seven days, 24 hours? Director. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm going to ask Mr Mallon to address that. Mr Mallon. Uh, the standard is 31 days and we comply with that standard. 31 days. Do we destroy it or is it automatic? Automatically yes. overwrites itself? Yeah. Over automatically. Thank you. Any other questions on that before we move on? Thanks, councillors. We'll move on to the next item then. Thank you. Next item is a notice of motion 008 of 21, elected member and chief executive officer reimbursement of expenses. Uh, the recommendation is on page 145 of the agenda and is on screen. Um, any questions in relation to that item? Councillor Spencer Teo. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I noticed in the monthly financials that um, in November there was a couple of um, councillors claiming for expenses, but the um, register hasn't been updated since the 11th of October. So I was just wondering, um, have there been any other claims other than November to date between 11th of October and to date? Um, understand if that needs to be taken on notice. And could we have the register updated um, next Tuesday? Because obviously that will give us an indication of, of what's coming through. Mr Bo, or oh, direct uh, CEO. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, we can update the register. Uh, I've, the only ones that have been in the summary of the ones I'd signed uh, are a couple for a number of councils here. Uh, there haven't been significant uh, claims in that period that I'm aware of. Okay. And um, with the events, for example, um, there was a few councils who attended the McGowan breakfast. Um, would they have booked that? Because I know the city does sometimes book events on behalf of councillors and pays for them and then it, but it does still show up on the register. So with something like that, would the councillors have paid for it direct and got reimbursed or would the city have paid and then just put it on the, the register? I think the city pays for it, don't they? Um, CEO. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. If the request is made through us to make a booking on behalf of the councillors, then we would make that booking and record the payment. If the meeting or the booking was made direct, then they would do it by way of reimbursement. So in those cases, the councillor doesn't have to then come back and give you the receipt. It's already done automatically through staff. Is that correct? That CEO. is correct. Yeah. OK, thank you. Anything further, councillors, before we move on? Uh, thank you. We'll move to um, item nine, urgent uh, business. There is no urgent business tonight. Um, just for the sake of the uh, members of the public, council will now consider a confidential matter. I thank members of the public for our attendance tonight. Thank you all for coming along and ask that you please uh, leave the chamber in order for council to consider that confidential item.
It's, uh, what's the time? Is that 7? 7.35? Thanks, Jesse. 7.35 uh, p.m. and thank everybody uh, for their attendance. Karen, you just let me know when this recording is off.